introduce our speaker today, Westchester District Attorney Janet E. Fiore. Um, President George is in India on a recruiting trip, so I have the pleasure of welcoming, welcoming you all and, and uh, introducing our speaker. District Attorney Di Fiore has dedicated her career to public service as both a judge and prosecutor in Westchester County. She began her term as DA four years ago and leads a team of 120 assistant DAs which prosecutes nearly 40,000 criminal cases a year. Prior to her, prior to her election as DA, Di Fiore served as supervising judge of the criminal courts for the 9th Judicial <coughs> District covering Westchester, Dutchess, Orange, Rockland, and Putnam counties as a justice of the New York State Supreme Court and a judge of Westchester County Court. Before moving to the judiciary, she was a Westchester assistant DA for 10 years, including time as chief of narcotics in the county, coordinating drug enforcement and prosecution efforts within the county on behalf of local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies. Ms. D. Fiore serves on the boards and in leadership positions of numerous professional, civic, and local organizations and led the development of the Westchester Intelligence Center, which provides the technology, data mining, and expertise to analyze crime patterns in order to identify and locate offenders. A lifelong resident of Westchester County, Janet grew up in Mount Vernon and now resides in Bronxville with her husband, Dennis Glazer, a partner at the law firm of Davis Polk and Wardwell, whom she met at St. John's Law School. And when I read their bios, I said their kids have to be going into law or public service. And sure enough, all of their kids who went to Bronxville High, Alexandra is an assistant district attorney in Manhattan. Joe, a Yale graduate, works for Senator Gillibrand, and son Michael's a junior at Fairfield University. Please join me in a warm welcome for the Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Paul. That was a very nice introduction, and um, thank you for inviting me here today. And, you know, as I look around the room and when I was mingling in the breakfast, there are so many people in this room that I probably know 25, 30 years, Jane and Gary probably all my life. <laughs> uh, but I've never had the opportunity to address this group and speak to you all in a formal way about uh, the criminal justice system and what's going on in the law enforcement community, not only here in Westchester County, but across the state and across the country. So I'm um, pleased to have this opportunity to talk to this group. Surprise, you're all here at 7 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Very pleased to have the opportunity. Uh, so I thought, since this is my inaugural address, that I'll talk to you a little bit um, generally about the district attorney's office, the role of the prosecutor in the community, my view of what the prosecutor's office, what, what services and what mission the prosecutor's office has, and the initiatives that I've put in place over the last four years support that view. And then hopefully we'll take some questions at, at the end. Yes, the best part of the rabbit part. So I always start my talk by reminding people of the importance of the prosecutor's office. And in fact, that it is my belief, and I think and I hope at the end of this discussion you will see in a more real sense what I mean, that the prosecutor's office is the most important and sensitive office in local government, any prosecutor's office, not just your district attorney's office. And I say that for uh, several reasons. So the main reasons I tell you that is because of two, two things. Number one, the work that we do in the prosecutor's office every day affects the quality of life of every single person in the community that we serve and that our services, unlike other government offices, are provided to everyone in the community without regard to who you are, what your station in life is, what your position in your community is, whether you are a tax-paying resident of Westchester County, whether you are a visitor who is merely traveling through our county on your way somewhere else, whether you are, most importantly, a citizen of this great country that we live in, or if you're living here in an undocumented status. Our services don't change. The same services are provided no matter who you are. Very important distinction between us and other um, government agencies and officials. And second, and, and very, very important, on a very, um, on a jurisprudential level, and a fairness level, the work that we do in the prosecutor's office determines whether people receive justice. 
I think that rather than thinking of my job as being just about the old-fashioned thought, uh, handcuffs in prison, my job and the way I think about approaching public safety here in Westchester is that it, it's, it's our obligation to find the right combination of initiatives and solutions to address public safety. And whether that be, of course, with strong prosecution initiatives, prosecuting people who commit crime and holding them appropriately accountable for their crimes, effective alternatives to incarceration for all of those many uh, people who have sociological issues that drive their crime, not only addressing that end act, that last act before they're poised and ready to be held accountable, but all those issues that brought that person to, to our office, to the courts, to make certain that not only are we holding him or her accountable for the crime, but we are being smart and putting in place dispositions that will prevent that person from going forward and committing new and additional crimes. And of course, using technology in a real and effective way to address public safety issues. So, we have these two sides of our house, the prosecution <coughs> side and the prevention side. That's the modern prosecutor's office, the office that we're running here in Westchester County. A little bit about the office. We have 125 assistant district attorneys on our staff, and we do prosecute almost 40,000 cases every year in the courts here in Westchester County. It's an enormous caseload, but we have here in Westchester, and we've been blessed, we have career prosecutors in this district attorney's office that have dedicated themselves to public safety and enhancing the quality of life for everyone in this community. And I have lawyers on my staff, these career prosecutors, who have been with the district attorney's office for 20, 25, 30 years and are still and are more effective today than they were 10 years ago, 15 years ago. We sort of have the inverse effect. The longer you're there, the more skilled you become. And you know, in this job, you need a very finely honed and tuned sense of justice and fairness. And certainly, you would be very, very proud to examine up closely the work that the career prosecutors here in Westchester are doing on your behalf. So we have these 125 lawyers. We have 38 police officers. I run a small police department. What uh, uh, by, well actually by Westchester standards, it's a rather large police department within the district attorney's office. Very experienced police officers there who do our investigative work for us. And of course we have lots of support staff to help us move our work forward. <laughs> we are located, our main office, in the Richard J. Durango Courthouse in White Plains. We occupy several floors there and in addition, we have eight facilities um, dispersed throughout the county, eight of our branch offices. We have offices in Mount Vernon, and New Rochelle, and um, Yonkers, and White Plains, and Rye, and Greenberg, and Northern Westchester, and in uh, Mount Kisco, and at Yorktown and Mount Kisco. And the reason we have these branch offices is uh, many years ago, we had a brilliant, brilliant district attorney here who served for 26 years, James Garris Bottom was his call, but Gary Webb to be my mentor and taught us all about what justice and, and, and what is always the right thing to do with the power that's invested in the prosecutor's office. And he devised a, a branch office system because he thought, and rightfully so 40 years ago, that we needed to bring our prosecution services from a very centralized office directly into the community. So we have, and I run all these branch offices that are staffed with prosecutors in all of those jurisdictions, and we handle the cases right at the lowest level in the community where they should be handled. All the misdemeanor cases are handled starting to the first judge court, I think it's here, who's six and who sits in one of our local courts and handles on our behalf misdemeanor cases from start to finish, it would be very serious cases, and felony cases during the initial stages, and then they are transferred ultimately up to White Plains where we handle those cases in White Plains. So on this prosecution side, and these thousands of cases we handle, it takes a lot of hard work and skill on the part of these career prosecutors to achieve that sort of success. Um, these initiatives that we have in place, these prosecution initiatives, as I said before, are very strong. 
and they target individual types of crime. We have uh, prosecution initiatives that target violent criminals in the community, that target people who commit crimes against children, crimes against the elderly, people who commit sexual assaults on uh, women and, and uh, throughout the county. And these initiatives, we design these initiatives in direct response to the needs of the community, the public safety needs of the community. Uh, I don't wake up one day and say, gee, wouldn't it be a great idea to have an, an initiative around crimes committed against children? No, we do that because we study <coughs> crime trends and crime patterns and make certain that our services are matched to the public safety needs of the community. And as I started to say before, the real trick to being an effective district attorney is to constantly lead my office and review that work and the efficacy of those initiatives and to be strong enough and confident enough in myself that if we think that those initiatives are no longer meeting the public safety needs of the community, to tinker with them, change them, maybe abandon them, maybe they never worked from the start. Maybe that initiative has been satisfied and we can move those resources on and into a different area. Every week I have a, what we call our ComStat, sort of a bastardized from the NYPD's approach, and I call out every division. We have five divisions in the DA's office where these 125 lawyers staff those divisions. And every week I have them in in a big room and I'm grilling them on what's happening in the courts, what's happening on your cases, what's happening on your investigations, is this initiative working? And we have performance measures that we go over every week to make certain that we are being responsible to the community. Um, and again, I think that the proof is in the eating of the pudding, and I say this humbly but very proudly, that we do have one of the highest felony conviction rates in the state of New York. And, and uh, for that, I owe a credit attitude to the professionalism and the care that's taken by the <coughs> in our office and on behalf of everyone here in Westchester. So that's basically the prosecution side. I'm going to give you an example of a prosecution initiative that we thought was strong, and upon examination, we figured out it you know, really wasn't working uh, the best way that it possibly could. And it's around one of my favorite initiatives, which is child protection issues and enhancing the public safety for children in the community. Uh, when I first arrived in the district attorney's office four years ago, I, as Paul said, have had a fair amount of experience in the criminal justice system, starting as an assistant DA, serving as a bureau chief in the DA's office, that's one of the high level supervisory positions in, in our structure, serving as a judge in literally every trial court, the family court, which really gave me the best perspective on the work that I do, and being the, the administrative judge for all the criminal courts. And I knew intuitively, but as a judge, you can't delve too deeply into other people's work. You sort of have to be reactive and hear the cases in the context of the courtroom and the evidence, of course. Um, I knew that we weren't getting it exactly right in this area of crimes committed against children. So I sort of commenced this little internal study. And when a child is uh, reported to be the victim of a crime, lots of bells and whistles go off for lots of different government officials and agencies, and, and that's the way it absolutely should be. Lots of people have the responsibility to take information from that incident and figure out what's happening in that child's life, what services were provided, <coughs> did we go wrong somewhere in trying to protect that child. But the way in the practical way in which that was unfolding was a child, this is the ordinary scenario, a child shows up at school and either a teacher or a principal or a school nurse sees that something's off and thinks that the child may have been harmed in some way. They interview the child. If they suspect that there's been a crime committed or some sort of abuse against the child, they call the school nurse. The school nurse interviews. Child. The school nurse calls the CPS worker. The CPS worker interviews the child. The CPS worker calls the police. The police interview the child. And finally, they call the prosecutor, and the prosecutor interviews the child. Now, keep in mind that most children who become the victims of a crime become the victim at the hand of a person in whom they were supposed to have a trusting relationship. So you layer on top of that all of these strangers 
talking to this child about the most incredibly intimate and terrible and hair-raising details, you figure out very quickly that that is not the model that we should be following here in this county. So what I did was I convened a group of police chiefs and prosecutors and CPS workers and a forensic pediatrician, and we talked about best practices to put in place to handle these sorts of crimes. And what we came up with and where we are now in Westchester County is we no longer follow that approach. <coughs> what we have now is a multidisciplinary team approach to child abuse cases. <coughs> when a child in this county is reported to be the victim of a crime, all those very same bells and whistles go off again, as they should. But on my staff, we have a, uh, a case coordinator, a multidisciplinary team case coordinator, who is notified that a child may be the victim of a crime. She collects all the information. She convenes this team made up of the prosecutor's office, police, police <coughs> pediatrician, CPS, we discuss the case very quickly and briefly, and then one person from the team emerges as the liaison to that child. And it's that person's duty and obligation to interview the child, collect all the necessary information that not only they need, but that those other government officials need as well. So we minimize access to the child, trauma to the child, and recounting these horrible details of what took place. And we are also now doing this at a place called the Westchester Children's Advocacy Center, which is on the grounds of Valhalla. It is a center that is a state-of-the-art center where we take every child who has been the victim of a sexual assault or a serious physical assault. The child is interviewed there. And we have uh, the room and the facility set up, very child-friendly, lots of services available for children and their families. And we have an inter interview room there now that has the two-way mirrors and glass. The child can be interviewed in this very comfortable and lovely setting. Everyone else can be around, in the, around the perimeter of the room listening to the interview and communicating with the interviewer. And again, we feel that this model not only puts in place best practices to ensure that we are achieving and obtaining convictions in these very sensitive and, and important cases, but certainly a model that now elevates the best interest of that child to the top of the heap where that, where that really, really does belong and where we were missing that piece. So I'm, I'm not happy to tell you, but I will tell you that last year we had, I think it was 550 children were the victims of crime here in, in this county. And we're talking about serious crimes, crimes that range from sexual assaults to homicides. Uh, we have very, very skilled prosecutors in this area. These are really very um, highly trained and skilled lawyers who are trained in forensic interviewing techniques as they have related to children and are very, very good at what they do. They're very difficult cases. And I know sometimes you read the salacious headlines in the paper, plea bargain and sexual assault case against child. Well, many of these cases are difficult for us to prove for the obvious reasons. You have a four-year-old child. It's, if there is no forensic evidence, and sometimes there isn't any forensic evidence, because many of these crimes take place over many years, they're difficult cases to prove. And so when I was talking to you before about the balancing, the delicate balancing of sometimes competing interests, it's a perfect example about how to achieve an appropriate resolution in cases where oftentimes we have to figure out, okay, well, he could face 25 years, but we can't go to trial on this case because we have some <coughs> issue, not that we don't have that legally sufficient or probable cause, and not that it's not a case that's appropriately brought, but there are other issues, and so we try to find the appropriate res resolution for the sake of the child, and of course, always with a view toward public safety in the community. So that's an example on the prosecution side of having an initiative in place, examining that initiative, learning and figuring out that it wasn't serving the needs of the public the way we should be, and changing that work and tinkering with that work until we feel that we are on the track to getting it right. 
On the crime prevention side, we are, that's the new, modern, proactive side of our work. We're doing some remarkable things as well, I'm happy to tell you. Um, you know, crime prevention it takes many different forms, and it depends on where you live and who you are, what your crime prevention needs are. One of the reasons I know that I, I grew up in the city of Mount Vernon, I, one of the reasons I decided to stay here with my family and raise my family is because Westchester is a wonderfully diverse community. And I imagine that many of you feel the same way and were attracted here for the same reasons. We have very urban centers. We have a very rural uh, area in our county. We have very affluent, very challenged and modest communities as well. And in every one of the, those communities, the people and the residents who live there have different public safety needs. So we have many different constituencies that we have to serve. And even within those communities, there are sort of these sub-constituencies, whether they're children in the context of a school setting, specific constituencies, specific public safety needs related to that, whether they are people who make up our elder communities, very specific constituency with specific public safety needs. My job to know what those needs are and to make certain that we're putting in place all of the um, initiatives that are necessary to help people stay safe. Kids in the community, this one goes cuts across every uh, community, every demographic. One of my favorite things to do is to go out and having lived through this myself, is to go out into the community and talk to parents about the dangers of underage drinking and substance abuse. And if I allowed myself, and if I had the time, I could be out literally every single night talking to a parent group. I do that several nights a month because that's how um, in demand and, and how parents are thirsting for information because they feel so challenged today addressing the needs that the, the mental health and the physical health needs of children in our community today. So this crime prevention can take, you, you just name it, and, and, and there's a constituency that whose needs need to be addressed. But there are certain things that cut across all of them. And just, and I'll stop in a minute and take some questions if that's what you'd like me to do. But there are a couple of things I want to talk to you about on the crime prevention uh, side. I mentioned our intelligence center. I'd like to talk a little bit about that. My innocence work and the justice task force that we're working on and a couple of other things uh, in the area. The intel center. That is a very important piece of the work that we're doing in the law enforcement community here in Westchester. Um, in Westchester, unlike New York City where there's one police department, one police commissioner, he gives the order, everybody shares information, everybody follows the same track. Here in Westchester, we have 43 individually run local police departments. Every one of them has a chief of police or a police commissioner. Every one of them has a, their own specific needs. Every one of them is a hard-working police administrator. But for many, many years, each one of them have been working on their own issues in their own little silos. Layer on top of that, all the multi-jurisdictional law enforcement agencies that work here. We have the county police, their jurisdiction cuts across the whole county. We have the state police whose jurisdiction overlaps the entire county. We have all of our federal law enforcement partners. We work with the FBI, with the Drug Enforcement Administration, ATF, the Secret Service. There has never been a regular way for all of these agencies to collect and share all of the important crime data and information that each one of them has and works on on a daily basis. So when I became the DA, I started to call into my office on a regular basis the police chiefs and the commissioners of the seven, I guess it was at that time, uh, larger police departments that report 80% of the crime here in Westchester County. And we started to talk at these regular meetings about their individual issues in their communities, and then we led the discussion to the cross-jurisdictional issues. And we started and began the discussion about offenders who move across jurisdictions committing crimes, you know, the people who do the home invasions, the people who do commercial burglaries, that make us really very unsafe in our communities. And we, we read, 
very, very quickly, uh, it was realized that we, again, weren't doing things the way we should be here in Westchester. We had great cooperation between the departments, but the cooperation consisted of a very handmade uh, kind of um, system. One guy in one police department had a buddy in another police department. If there was an issue, he'd pick up the telephone and call his buddy. But of course, when that fellow retired or moved to a new assignment, that line of communication evaporated. So um, I'm not going to be modest about this, and I will just put it out there. I decided that we needed to lead an initiative here in Westchester to build a state-of-the-art intelligence center. And we have, and two years ago, we opened the Westchester Intelligence Center. It is modeled on NYPD's Real-Time Crime Center. I don't know if you saw the article recently in the New York Times about the Real-Time Crime Center. It's a magnificent initiative, and we have replicated that here in Westchester. And I can say this because I've told my friend Ray Kelly, well, not only do we rival them, I think we're doing a better job. <laughs> So it's in, in light planes, and I wish I could take you all there, but of course because of security reasons, we, we couldn't take you there. But now, every single police department here in Westchester County and every federal agency that operates here has the ability and the capability to upload all of their individual crime data and <coughs> intelligence into the Intel Center where we have crime analysts, detectives, police officers, field intelligence officers working there every day. And their job is to analyze that data, crunch the data, crunch the numbers, and return that information back to each of those individual police chiefs and commissioners so that those leaders can engage in what we call intelligence-led policing and make certain they know about emerging crime trends and patterns and they know how to deploy their resources in the best way to get out in front of crime patterns and make certain that they're keeping their communities safe. It has been a magnificent success and in fact yesterday we were notified that one of our crime analysts has been singled out to receive the Crime Analyst of the Year Award at a National Convention of uh, Crime Analysts this coming January. And her, the, the work that we did in that case was uh, a, uh, a patrol officer in the community stopped a car, developed some information. There had been a rash of burglaries, commercial burglaries, at these Best Buy places throughout Westchester County. And from one little pod of information, the crime analyst using all of the databases and information that's available at our Westchester Intel Center developed this entire case that scanned the entire eastern seaboard. They committed this group of, I think they're Russian immigrants, organized crime guys, very dangerous guys. 39 commercial burglaries up and down the Eastern Seaboard, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars of merchandise stolen. But most important, we get very nervous about those because we know that can't go on for very long without someone in the community being hurt, injured, or God forbid, even killed during the course of one of those burglaries. So we are thrilled about that case. We're thrilled that this analyst, whose hard work is paid off, will be. Um, um, uh, honored in this way, and we are very pleased with the work. Um, uh, as an aside, the Intel Center was built with very few taxpayer dollars. It's a multi-million dollar center. We built it mostly with asset forfeiture money. Those are um, dollars and money that we have forfeited from offenders who have been convicted of crimes and the proceeds that they had received from those crimes, we have forfeited that money and we take those dollars and we turn them around to fund our law enforcement initiatives. So that's the Westchester Intelligence Center. Crime prevention, of course, and also on the prosecution side, what, the way we have set up the Intel Center, we have encouraged and police departments are now using the Intel Center as their back office investigative arm and it's worked out exceedingly well for police departments around uh, the county. Um, wrongful convictions and innocence work. I want to take two minutes and talk to you about this very important initiative. When I was um, uh, 
two short months into my job as district attorney, I received a letter, or a call, I guess it was, from a friend and colleague named Barry Shep. He runs uh, something called the Innocence Project, which is a community of lawyers who work to overturn wrongful convictions based on DNA <coughs> evidence. And he asked me to look at a case that had taken place in um, Westchester many years <coughs> earlier. And he was telling me that he believed that the person committed this crime that he wanted me to look into had been wrongfully convicted. And it was the case of a young man who at the age of 16 was convicted of murdering a 15-year-old classmate of his up in Peekskill, New York. Uh, he was convicted by a jury. He had confessed to the crime. There was DNA evidence that was collected from the body of this woman that did not match this uh, offender's uh, DNA profile. That evidence was put before the jury. The jury knew that, it went forward, and they convicted him, and he was sentenced to a life sentence in state prison when he was 16 years old. So um, I spoke to, we spoke to the Innocence Project, and I um, directed my counsel to the case, review everything about the case and report back to me. And when she came back to me and, and was giving me the report, you know, after 30 years in this business, you do develop an instinct for him. I could just feel myself sinking into the chair because something just wasn't right about the case. And lo and behold, Barry Sheck's ask of me was that given the new technology in forensic sciences, he wanted me to direct at the Westchester lab to uh, retest the DNA evidence because he believed that we could figure out, based on new technology, the profile of who that, that um, biological evidence belonged to and that it might lead to something. And I agreed with him. And even though the law, believe it or not, and we're working on this, does not, under these circumstances, permit retesting, we found a way to do it. And lo and behold, not only with the new technology were we able to develop profile of the event of the person who left that uh, semen on the body of this young 15 year old girl but we learned that he was serving a life sentence for committing a murder of another woman two years after the 15 year old child had been killed in the same basically the same area in Westchester County so I sent two investigators up to the state prison where he was serving a life sentence for that second murder. And it was almost like in the movies. The investigators walked in and he basically said to them something like, you know, what took you guys so long? And he proceeded to confess to the murder of the 15-year-old child. The murder that the 16-year-old young man had served 17 years in state wow. prison. Talk about a uh, profession-altering and life-altering experience that was uh, quite an extraordinary experience. One that has, you know, of course impressed me, as you rightfully would expect me, I'm the prosecutor, to be impressed by that, and has caused me to devote all of my extra time and energy to innocence work and work to improve the accuracy of the criminal justice system. And last May, May Day, uh, I, Law Day, um, I'm proud to tell you that I was appointed by the Chief Judge of the Court of Appeals to lead, along with one of the, uh, our other Court of Appeals judges, this state's work on uh, wrongful convictions and innocence work. We have convened a task force, a very uh, important, impressive task force in, our, uh, in the work that we do. Uh, represented on the task force are members, the highest level members of every discipline that impacts wrongful conviction work. Uh, we have the prosecutor, and by the way, this is the first time the prosecutor has ever been asked to lead this work, and so the chief judge is very prescient about this stuff and really um, has convened the task force with <coughs> public safety in mind, making certain we are improving the accuracy of the, of the criminal justice system so that people, obviously, I mean, it's like I'm stating the obvious, who are innocent should not be wrongfully convicted of a crime they didn't commit. We have uh, Ray Kelly, who represents the police uh, discipline on the task force, and he's a magnificent addition to the task force, a very important member. We have very high-level judges. We have forensic scientists. 
um, the Innocence Project is represented, and we are moving forward, and we are a permanent task force to the Court of Appeals, and our job and our mission is to make recommendations, whether they are legislative recommendations, and by the way, we have the two chairs of the codes committee. Those are the committees that do all of the, um, the uh, crime legislation and on both the Senate side and the Assembly side. Very important, because a lot of this is going to require um, some legislative change as well. Um, so we have the legislature represented, we have the forensic sciences, the police, we have the exon uh, exonerees, people who have been wrongfully convicted and exonerated, represented on the task force. And our mission, as I uh, just started to say, is making legislative change, administrative change, recommendations for court rules, and training uh, for uh, forensic science issues, and for us to, in you know, the permanent nature of our task force, to can monitor any changes that are put in place for their to, to, make, to monitor their efficacy and whether or not they are doing the job of improving the accuracy of the criminal justice system. So those are some of the things that we're doing in the Westchester County DA's office on both the prosecution side and the prevention side. I hope that you are happy with what you hear that your In your opinion, what percentage of all convictions are wrongful? And a second question is, if you have 40,000 cases a year and 125 assistant DAs, that's one and a quarter, one and a half a day, uh, and it doesn't sound right. Well, it is right, and we, we do stand up on 40,000 cases a year. Many of those cases are the, um, about 1,700 of those cases are the felony cases that actually make it up to the county courthouse, the murder cases, the violent crime cases, the rapes, the robberies. Um, the rest of those cases are the less serious cases that are heard in the local courts and traffic, uh, the vehicle traffic cases, misdemeanor cases, petty larceny cases. Those are the lion's share of the cases. But of course, and I, I don't want anyone to misunderstand, not minimizing the importance of those cases because for anyone who is brought into the criminal justice system, it's a very serious event in their life and we treat it that way. And I would like to think that my assistants treat each and every case seriously as well. As to the number of cases in which people have been wrongfully convicted, it's a tough question. Um, I'm very confident in our work, but even one wrongful conviction is too many. I mean, you hear the story of this young man, and it's just, you know, you, you know that whatever resources are necessary to devote, whether it's one a year, God forbid, 20 a year, it's no matter. We have to make certain because there is so much power and authority invested in the work we do. We have to make certain, of course, that we are bold and strong in our work, but that we're getting it right every single time. Yes, sir. In, in the case that you mentioned about the wrongful conviction, yes. uh, how did they get the confession from this person? Well, he was a 16-year-old boy, and they had um, questioned him over the course of uh, several months, almost several weeks, and he kept inserting himself into the process. And uh, ultimately, I think that there was a several hour session, the last session, that, yeah, this 16 year old child. And remember, no though, food, no water. that was, well, no, actually, they water. did, but, but it was still a 16 year old boy. And uh, <coughs> well, um, that was 20 something years ago. Today, we do things very differently. Did he have a, a legal representation? He, he did not have a lawyer with him at the time, but there had been a lawyer involved in the case. Mm -hmm. What happened to him after he was exonerated? Well, he's struggling. Yeah. He's struggling. Mm -hmm. Which brings, you know, which is another initiative that we are working on, um, and it's called the prisoner reentry work. Um, I chair, I volunteer to chair all prisoner reentry work in Westchester County that relates to people who have served their sentences in state prison, have completed their, their sentences, and are now ready to be released, and they have indicated they are returning home to Westchester County. 
my job is to make certain we are working to make that transition a smooth and successful one. And most people say, you know, you're the DA, what, what, why do you care about guys who are coming out of prison? I care a lot. First of all, it's the right thing to do. If somebody has served their time and paid their debt, it's the right and decent thing to do to help someone get back on their feet. But second, I'm the district attorney, and I have to worry about people coming back to live in Westchester, and this is, and I'm not afraid to say it, a very high-risk population. We have men and women, and we're mostly men, so we'll talk about the men, who have served 5, 10, 15, 25 years in state prison, and now they're getting ready to come home. Uh, most people go to state prison uh, because they have been unable in their lives to successfully negotiate life. They get into state prison, they're housed for 20 years. Our correctional practices in New York State leave a lot to be desired. And then at the end, at the back end of their sentence, they're ready to come home, and they come out worse than when they went in, which is oftentimes with substance abuse issues, mental health issues, no real learning issues, no real vocational skills. So they come home, and within you know a very short time, a very high percentage of these new crimes. My job is to, and I have put together this task force where we have fabulous services here in Westchester County, and I have all the service providers around the table, uh, government service providers, nonprofit providers, we have people from the faith community, we have people from uh, the school community, vocational trainers, and we, have, we get a list of everyone who's scheduled to come back. We figure out what their service needs are. Everyone is scheduled to come back and on parole. We figure out what their service needs are. We identify them. We contact them before they're released, and we put together a service plan for them because it's not easy for many people to access government services under the best of circumstances, let alone these guys who've been in for 20 years. And, and the sad reality is many people don't come back to a supportive, family that provides them a safety and they're you know, left on their own to negotiate housing and jobs and it's just a disaster. And there is a um, wonderful, wonderful, very philanthropic man here in, in Bronxville and I'm not going to say his name but um, although you probably wouldn't mind but I won't, um, who has supported with a lot of money one of these prisoner reentry programs. And he is building up a vocational training school for men who come out of prison and are looking for a particular vocational training. This group gets them jobs during the day, very, you know, ordinary meaning, menial jobs. Uh, and the idea of that is to retool people into um, uh, living a, a scheduled life difficult for some people to do that. And at night, they go to vocational school. And this fellow from Brownsville has funded that organization and that operation, and we're doing some wonderful, wonderful things with them. Um, so again, that's on the crime prevention public safety side. And this young man who was wrongfully convicted, he's having a hard time. It's hard for people, especially, as you can imagine, child, 16 years old, goes into state prison. His whole young adult life is shaped inside four prison walls. And not a good fit. Very difficult for people to come out okay on the back end of that. Sport. A very successful initiative, which we've worked out with you, is that Bronxville, Tuckahoe, Eastchester, and Scarsdale police forces, all small, now cooperate in doing drug arrests, and following up on initiatives and they get support from your uh, police force. Absolutely. You know, for those of us who live in this area, and particularly in Brownsville, we are very lucky. We have a terrific, <laughs> terrific chief of police, uh, and, and in the surrounding areas as well. And they have pulled their resources, and they're being very, very smart about consolidating some of their uh, police services and working together to keep the community safer. I love when I see those DWI checkpoints. <laughs> yeah, yeah, guys. Yes, sir. The, uh, you mentioned you handle um, illegals as well as legals, if you will. Is that a is that a, a, a law or is that a Westchester County decision? In other words, if I were living in another community, would the same principles apply? Would the same district attorney? Yes. 
Yes, so I have a constitutional <laughs> mandate to provide services to everyone in the community. Everyone. And absolutely. And those yeah. immigration issues are, as far as I'm concerned, federal issues. And it would be a terrible, terrible message for the prosecutor's office to send to the undocumented people in our community that you are not welcome to our services. Because what happens is, uh, people who commit crimes are very opportunistic people, and they see a group of people who are afraid of law enforcement or have something to hide and aren't willing to come forward to the law enforcement community to report crimes, and right away that group of people become prey for the opportunistic criminal. So my message is, come to us. We don't care what your immigration status is. We will never ask what it is, and we will help to protect you. Good. Judge. <clears throat> yes, I was interested in, in whether uh, there are specialized bureaus for organized crime and for, say, terrorism, and whether there are uh, convictions in those areas. Absolutely. We have an organized crime bureau in our investigations division. We do some very sophisticated and complicated investigations. That's where we do most of our electronic surveillances, the wiretapping, the dropping, the uh, video surveillance work. And we've got a very um, impressive record on our convictions in the organized crime as well. Very active. Yes, John? Crime doesn't stay at home. Yeah. And we're near Connecticut, but we're certainly near New York State. How often do we find ourselves, or do you find yourselves, um, looking for or trying somebody who doesn't? That is an excellent, excellent question. And uh, through our work in the intelligence center, we now have the NYPD sitting at our regular meetings. And we, they have access to our crime data, and we now have access to theirs. Because we track the uh, residency of people who commit crimes in this community. And there is a very large percentage of people who cross over the border from the city, come to our community, and commit crimes here in our community. So we are on that, and we work very, very carefully and collaboratively. This, the this young up and coming Kelly guy, I guess. <laughs> he, is, he is a magnificent partner. I can't say enough good things about him. And he's become not only a very strong professional ally, but a great and personal friend as well. And, and Westchester is served very well by having Commissioner Kelly in the NYPD. Talk a little about the financing of your, of your the department. You spoke a little about that in the Health Center. But um, there's a big budget, it sounds like. Yeah. All the personnel. Have, where do you stand within the county, and mm -hmm. are you feeling any pressure because of the progress? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 well, so. You know, not for, from Robin. Uh, Rob, Rob is a great, very well intentioned guy, and I wish him great success. He's got a tough, tough um, mission ahead of him. But, you know, I didn't start watching taxpayer dollars when, and after I told this yesterday, I didn't start watching taxpayer dollars about when you were elected. Uh, I did this as soon as I had the responsibility to laud over a budget, which when I became district attorney was really the first time. As a judge, you don't, you don't have a budget, you have a very small staff. Now I have a very large staff and I have a $25 million budget. And every year since I have been the district attorney, I am very proud to tell you, and for those of you who have managed the budget, you know that this is a difficult thing to do. I've returned, on average, about $1.2 million in savings every year from my budget back to the county. That doesn't happen by accident. That happens because you're paying the net with your staff. And I have this thing that says, spend every taxpayer dollar as if it were our own. We go over every Tuesday, every Tuesday, I have my top staff in with me, and we go over where we are, how, much, how many dollars we're spending, how we are spending our dollars, how we are using our resources. And I'm fixated on that issue because I have been entrusted with a lot of money from the taxpayers. And it's my job and my responsibility and my mission to spend it correctly and appropriately. We're feeling pressure, though. You know, the county's feeling pressure. Um, recently, there has been a, um, a call to have our public employees contribute to our health care benefits for the first time ever in Westchester County. And while I support that, I, 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 uh, I totally support that, we have to be careful about those things. I have people on my staff 
who have worked for 30 years, you know, these career prosecutors. That's what we encourage in our office. Unlike other uh, businesses where you try to move people out the longer they're there, we try to encourage people to stay. For, and I hope that the, um, the complexity of our work has come through in my talk today and the reason why we need these people to stick around. Um, but many people who have been there for 30 years are feeling a little uh, unfairly treated because for, they made decisions to uh, devote their lives to public safety in the prosecutor's office and, and they could have made other choices in their life um, and they feel that a little bit that the world's being pulled out from under them 30 years in. So we're working on that. We're working on that issue and we're having discussions. But we are feeling pressure and we are looking to um, save taxpayer dollars in every smart and thoughtful way. On the preventative side and on a very local level, can you talk to us a little bit about what your office is doing in the alcohol and substance abuse issue, particularly in Queens? Lots, lots. We work with virtually and literally every single school district in the county. I personally go out, as I said, a couple of nights a week to talk to parents. I do the parent stuff about uh, the dangers of underage drinking and talk through some strategies about how I have to talk about some of the strategies to put in place to keep our children safe and to give parents information about what's happening in the community, what's happening in terms of the illegal drugs that are available to kids, so they have that information. Um, in addition to that, I have required every one of our assistant district attorneys to give a certain number of hours above and beyond their office work and be out in the community and, um, and sort of that pro bono service. So our prosecutors go into the schools and we do this program called the Pro Law Program where we talk to kids about all of the challenges that they face. Um, so we're doing a lot in that area. We we'll work with the Bronx schools all the time. Janet, could you just follow up on that very subject for one second? Yes, sir. Is the trend line of those incidents, and we'll just say in Westchester, flat? Going up, going down. The trend line for underage drinking yes. and substance abuse. Yeah. It spiked about five years ago, or six years ago, and now it's staying constant at a high at a higher level than of course we want to see it. One of the things that I watch across the county are the emergency room admissions of young people. It's extraordinary. You make the hair on the back of your neck stand that. Um, we had a couple of incidents. I'm a big believer in um, public education campaigns. And every time I spot a trend that's happening, we like to do a public education campaign. We had a few incidents where children were out being high-spirited like they are wanted to be, and they got into trouble with uh, the uh, consumption of alcohol. And one child in particular that I'll never forget passed out. It's a snowy night, he passes out on the sidewalk. His friends panic, run and leave him there. But for the grace of God, this child was found at 11 o'clock at night by a woman who was walking her dog. She decided to take a walk down the street. The child would have died on the street there. So we started this uh, public education campaign, which we've incorporated into all of these sessions that we do with parents and with the kids. And the, the, the mes message to kids is never hesitate to call for help. No matter what it is you are doing, don't fear the trouble you will get into for that because if, it's, if it has to do with the criminal justice system, I make those determinations and I will take into consideration the good work that you do by getting help for your friend. And a lot of kids think, oh, they'll sleep it off. Get, mm, not good, not good. So that's one of our messages. But it, is, it did spike and it, it, it's remaining flat, but up too high, much too high. And kids are, you know, drinking in different ways. They're getting strained. Mission is to go out and get drunk and get drunk. Very dangerous. Very dangerous. Can you talk about DNA evidence and it, especially in the case in Peekskill? It seems that anybody that's had reductive biology DNA evidence is very powerful. Do you find yourself uh, having to educate juries time after oh, time in terms of absolutely, the power? absolutely. In fact, you know it's called the CSI effect. Now we are at a disadvantage 
when we have a case, and there are many cases where there is no forensic evidence that's been identified and collected. And when that happens, we're really at a disadvantage because jurors, you know, they watch TV and they think, there it is. Now, can you do this in 20 minutes? Well, of course, the reality is no. And in many cases, as I said, there is no forensic evidence. So we have to approach our work differently. You know, it's always changing, a changing dynamic. And we do have to educate jurors about those issues. And, you know, you have to do it carefully within the context of a criminal trial for an expert witness or whatever is appropriate in, in that case. Yeah, when of course we love the NA evidence. It's incredibly powerful on both sides to convict the guilty and to exonerate or protect the innocent. And I am in favor of an all crimes DNA bill. And there is a move afoot. In fact, uh, Jeff Klein, the senator who represents this district, has proposed legislation that. Right now, the legislation around DNA collection is if you are convicted of a felony or certain enumerated misdemeanors, upon your conviction, you must provide a DNA sample to the New York State Data Bank. And we keep that sample there, and we match it, and we solve crimes that way. We also exonerate people that way. Um, it, but that's upon conviction of the crime. Je Senator Klein's bill is proposing that in certain violent offenses, if you are arrested for that offense, you're required to give a sample of your DNA upon arrest, just like a fingerprint. And if you are convicted, your sample stays on file. If you are exonerated, acquitted of that crime, your DNA sample is returned to you. On that score, do they use still use lie detector tests? Are they pretty much obsolete now? No, they're not admissible. Yeah, no, they don't even use them they're at not, all. They're not, no, because yeah. they're not reliable. Reality TV. People thought it would be liable for Yes, sir. Um, the Peace Slope case that you're referring to, that's the Deskovic case, right? Yes, it is. Um, isn't he writing a column in Circus newspaper uh, pretty frequently? And hasn't he, hasn't he sued Westchester County and the yes. state to recover damages yes. for his 15? So, um, it, maybe it's not as bad a situation as you portray, especially if he's successful in the suit. But getting back to this, he confessed, okay, he's only 16. And you mentioned there's 125 uh, assistant district attorneys. Many of them have served 20, 25, 30 years in, your op in the office under McGarry, Jeanine, and yourself. Who are the assistant district attorneys that prosecuted this case? Are they still working for you? And has any action been taken against them? Yes. Well, after we, Mr. Destrick was exonerated in that case, I commissioned an independent panel, not having anything to do with the DA's office, to review the case, to analyze what took place in that case, and figure out what went wrong in that case. And there were many things that went wrong in that case. And don't forget, that was a case that was investigated by the police, prosecutors. It was tried before a very experienced judge. There was a lawyer, he had counsel from the very beginning from the Legal Aid Society. A jury heard that case and a jury convicted him on that evidence and he did in fact falsely confess to the crime. So there wasn't one individual person who was at fault there, there was a confluence of circumstances that came together to pr produce that conviction. So that case will be litigated in the federal district court, um, and we'll see, you know, what what the court finds there. But um, the prosecutor was not um, sanctioned. There was nothing to sanction him for. He developed the evidence. He presented the evidence. There was a hearing. First of all, there was a hearing before the judge to test the voluntariness and the admissibility of the confession. The judge found that the confession had been properly obtained by the police and he allowed that confession to go before the jury. There was a full-blown trial with the prosecutor presenting the people's evidence and defense counsel having an opportunity to challenge that evidence. And at the end, a jury of 12 people deliberated over that evidence and unanimously found that Mr. Deskovic had convicted. Hey, we have time for a couple of questions. Didn't the prosecutor know that there wasn't a DNA match? You said the jury got a yes. DNA match that wasn't, no, no, no. wasn't a match. You, you missed what I said. Yes, of course the prosecutor did. And the prosecutor revealed that immediately. Oh. And in fact, the prosecutor put that before the jury. There was no um, uh, hiding of evidence in that. There was a very open trial before one of the most experienced judges in this county. 
Did he rescind the confession at any point? No. He no. never rescinded? No. We have time for one more question. Jason, did you have a question? Sure. Uh, I was just wondering, as someone who was a family court judge and, and now is the DA for Westchester, if you had any thoughts on um, for, for juvenile offenders, at what age they're best served by family court and at what age it should be handled by criminal court? Well, right now in New York State, children who commit crimes and who are between the ages of 7 and 16, right before their 16th birthday, are handled in the family court. And that's a very rehabilitative court. That is a court that is designed to figure out what's going on with a child and the child's family and put in place dispositions to support the child and the family to help the child move forward. Uh, once you cross over to the age of 16, it's a whole different ballgame. And those people, notwithstanding how young they are, are tried in the adult criminal court. Very different court, obviously. We're not a rehabilitative court anymore. It's a punitive court. Make no mistake about it. And there are some very vexing issues associated with prosecuting children in the criminal courts. I have worked hard to make certain that we are putting in place dispositions that are designed not only to punish children, and I don't think about it in terms of punishing children, but hold them accountable, and, and be smart about it to put in place services to support the child going forward. We have an in, we started an integrated youth court here in Westchester County, first in the state. And that court is it's not an alternative to incarceration. It's a court that will hold a child appropriately, as I like to say, accountable, and put in place strong dispositions to move that kid forward in a positive, successful way.